Hello again, dads and dad lovers. We are back at it, struggling through why the father's rights movement is bad. So far, we've learned all kinds of interesting things. We've learned that in spite of the fact that 85% of the population is in favor of shared custody, it's actually bad because we're still figuring that out. So far, the strongest evidence for why the entire idea of shared parenting is bad is that some men are abusive, which every law covering shared presumed joint custody has provisions regarding abuse has specific portions of the motion that clearly state except in the case of abuse, neglect, or inability to provide. Those things are all very clearly taken care of. So we just suffered through the issue with presumed joint custody. We are just about to dive into the invention of parental alienation syndrome. Author Katie Allison Garanju described her total shock when her soon-to-be ex-husband announced he was vying for custody of their children. You were totally shocked that the father of your children wanted custody of his children? In her New York Times essay, Losing Custody of My Hope, Grandju, the author of a guidebook on attachment parenting, had been the parent to step back from the workforce and serve as the children's primary caregiver. She wrote that her former spouse cited possible parental alienation syndrome as a bolstering factor in his bid for custody. So if you aren't familiar with parental alienation syndrome, essentially it is the act of one parent doing everything in their control to distance the child from their other parent. So this can be things like convincing them that their other parent is bad, convincing them that their other parent does not want them, convincing them that their other parent is providing nothing. Essentially, it's the idea of emotional and mental manipulation to turn your child against the other parent. I'm sure the majority of you watching can say, yeah, I can see how something like that could happen or know of an experience where you know of it happening. So the fact that I'm about to read an article right now that is like, let's look into this little myth is it's tough to do. I will admit that. It's very tough to do. So anyway, this ex-husband is citing parental alienation. I mean, I can kind of see why he might if this is a woman who is shocked that he even wants to be involved. Psychiatrist Richard Gardner coined the term in the late 1980s. One outgrowth of this warfare over custody was the development in children of what I refer to as the parental alienation syndrome. Typically, the child viciously vilifies one of the parents and idealizes the other. This is not caused simply by parental brainwashing of the child. Rather, the children themselves contribute their own scenarios in support of the favored parent. My experience has been that in about 80 to 90 percent of cases, the the mother is the favored parent and the father the vilified one. So it's interesting to me that the original person who coined this term was actually like, yeah, the kids are doing it to themselves. I have to argue with that. I'm not a psychologist. I am not a professional of any kind. I am a lady on YouTube. However, I do think that it's very unnatural for a child to villainize one of their parents. I, I don't think that there's any way that something like that could just happen organically. There have to be contributing factors. I'm not saying that it's necessarily one person brainwashing them. It could be the fact maybe their parent actually is absent and actually abandoned them. Parental alienation syndrome seems to have entered the courts based on Dr. Gardner's anecdotal observations. Father's rights advocates and bloodthirsty lawyers seized upon the idea and pushed it further. Although it remains relatively undocumented and hasn't received much formal study, the internet quickly reveals many resources, particularly for men, for those disheartened by their own divorce negotiations. It takes little effort to stumble upon descriptions of parental alienation syndrome. For example, Dr. Rena Summer defines parental alienation syndrome on her website as the deliberate attempt by one parent and or guardian or significant other to distance his or her child from the other parent and describes parental alienation syndrome as a form of child abuse. Cause it is. 
Among the attributes that signal parental alienation syndrome during high conflict divorces, according to Summer, are conflict between the divorcing spouses and change of geographical location on the part of one spouse. She neglects to point out either of these situations could occur without the desire to poison the children against the other parent during such a split. Summer's advice, no one knows your children and what is best for them better than you, comes with a price tag. Scrolling down her page are multiple opportunities to buy her book, Children's Adjustment to Divorce, Educating Yourself your attorney and the court. Available on sale at $37 to download for immediate consumption. Okay, I like that she tries to add in like, oh, well, there are things that look like parental alienation that aren't parental alienation. Sometimes people have other reasons for moving away. If you had a child with someone and that is the life that they know and you just up and move away after the relationship ends, you are not trying in your child's best favor to give them the best life because you're trying to run away from the other parent. Yes, there are times that a parent may need to move. There is a difference between needing to move for work and trying to run away from the other parent. There are also certain things that are just very clearly parental alienation syndrome and nothing else. Telling a child that their father doesn't want them is child abuse. <laughs> While some courts have begun to take parental alienation syndrome into consideration as a factor in custody deliberations, the term has not been accepted by the American Psychiatric Society, nor entered into the DSMV, which is considered the Bible of Psychiatric Diagnoses. Despite this, various paid expert witnesses in child custody cases across the country assess parental alienation syndrome as a presenting factor. Just because something is not classified as a psychological disorder does not mean that it's not a valid experience that people are facing. Racism is also not in the DSM IV book. Does that mean that racism doesn't happen? Fighting over child support. Introduction of parental alienation syndrome is just one of many strategies that father's rights advocates are employing to bolster men's quests for shared or sole custody. So like they think that we're just making up that this stuff is happening to see our kids. You think that people are just making up these horrifying experiences to give them a better ammunition? Again, why is he not just given the opportunity to have joint custody? It's so annoying that they see parental alienation syndrome as the strategy that is just being deployed. Like it's not something that's really happening to people's lives. Janetta Candelario, an assistant professor of sociology at Smith College, found her divorce negotiations suddenly turned contentious a few years ago. The divorce was almost finalized. We had a date, a parenting plan, mediation results entered into the court record, everything, recalls Candelario. Then I got a Fulbright scholarship, which would take me and the children away for six months. He, her ex-husband Juan, was upset about that. He also didn't want to pay a lot of money. Well, yeah, and we have to, we can't just villainize her ex-husband Romero right off the bat because the idea of paying so much more in child support because you are not spending all those overnights with the children for half the year is not very appealing. We can't just say he's a bad dad because he's bringing up the negative side of the money in that. Like, every single mom cuts coupons. Okay, trying to cut your expenses where you can is not necessarily indicative of a careless father. I think we can all agree that his main concern is being away from his children for six months. Personal story, I work in IT. My big dream was working in IT and working in big tech long before I was ever a mom. Long before children were ever a sprinkle in my eye. And when my daughter was about three months old, I finally had the opportunity to fly out to California and work on a huge project. But it would take me away from my family for six months, similarly. And they wouldn't offer to bring them out with me. They said they needed only me. I couldn't do it. I could not miss six months of my daughter's life growing up. There, there was no money in the world even though I knew that that could lead to so much greater opportunities for me in my career, there's no way I was willing to sacrifice six months of my child's life. And this mom thinks that this should just be a default, easy option for the dad. Oh, well, I wanna to go to college and it's my dream, so you should just give up everything that's important to you to make this happen for me. Him prioritizing your dreams is over. That ended with the divorce. Now it's what's best for the kids. Is your education what's best for the kids? I don't know, but I don't know why you as the mom are the one who gets to make the sole executive decision on that. We, we don't know the father's career or what that provides for the children. 
Why can't the dad have custody while you're away at school? Why is that option so impossible? Candelario explains further that Stephanie, her ex-husband's girlfriend, has a daughter by an ex-boyfriend. Okay, blended families are very common. The boyfriend is an engineer who made about $80,000 a year to her customer service position pay of about $30,000. Although the ex-boyfriend hadn't been terribly interested in the daughter, he obtained joint custody. Juan said he's so lucky not to pay child support. Before she moved in with Juan, Stephanie had to live at a friend's house with her daughter for six months while her ex-boyfriend kept the beautiful house. So again, they want us to demonize Romero because he has vocalized that he's not interested in paying child support. We have got to stop villainizing men simply for not being interested in paying child support. What is so wrong with a man wanting to make his own autonomous decisions with where his money goes in regards to his children? What is so wrong with a man not really being keen on the fact that a state and his ex will be determining how his money is used for the child? Don't we want to acknowledge that maybe it's a little bit degrading for the man that he doesn't have a say in how his own money is being used for his child? Because obviously these same women would be super offended if it was the man getting paid child support, they would want to know where every single dollar went into. But because he doesn't want to pay child support, he's a bad dad. Just bad by default. Let's not forget that he also doesn't want to spend six months away from his kids. So he's a bad dad for not wanting to pay child support, okay? But then he's also a bad dad for not wanting to spend six months away from his child. Can dads do anything right? Is that legal? Romero had a child in New Jersey from his first marriage. With this daughter, he had visitation rights, but not custody. Candelario never envisioned he'd seek joint custody for their son and daughter. Because the Fulbright would mean a change in the kid's visitation schedule short term, Romero was in a position to contest existing agreements. For months, Candelario wondered why Romero was suddenly engaged in such a bitter battle. Was it money or feeling he'd lost control of his child after the dissolution of his first marriage? Or did he believe me to be a bad mother, she wondered at the time. Eventually I dreamt, Google him. So she is so confused that he would fight for custody of his child just because he didn't win custody of his first child. Like her whole thought process in this is, wow, the system hasn't beaten him down badly enough. Let's keep working at it. And then her other thought is the only reason that he's pursuing custody is because he thinks that she's a bad mom. So many moms think this. They take a man wanting more time with his child so personally. Like, what's wrong with the time they're spending with me? N nothing. It's just that they have two parents and they should be spending their time shared between both of those parents. You see, you are not more important just because you're the mom. Just like he is not more important just because he's the dad. This is really hard for people to understand, isn't it? So anyway, she Googles him. Upon reading a testimonial posted on the internet by Romero, Candelario better understood why he was fighting for her so hard. Part of Romero's testimonial reads, In my case, I have a lawyer. However, who can afford to call a lawyer with every little question during this emotional roller coaster time in our lives? After leaving a brief email at the National Brotherhood of Fathers' Rights describing my circumstances, I received a phone call from Dennis Gack. I was very impressed with Mr. Gack's legal knowledge and personal experiences. On May 2002, I became a member of the National Brotherhood of Fathers' Rights. The amount of information that I have received thus far is more than worth the membership price of $675, and I have unlimited consultation for this price for one year. On his website, Gak describes his own history with divorce in an open letter to fathers. I have formal legal training from the University of Michigan and William Howard Taft Law School in Southern California. But 15 years ago, despite all my legal training, I was not prepared for the prejudice that I faced when I went through my divorce. I quickly got up to speed and fought my way to fairness against an extremely disagreeable ex-wife. Shared custody, no child support, and a fair property settlement resulted after I learned the correct approach and legal techniques. Because the family court system is becoming more and more skewed against us fathers, more men are falling behind in their child support payments and receiving less time with their kids. You can actually help by pursuing your own case with vigor before it's too late. So she's using her ex-husband's testimonial on this legal service kit as this is the reason that he's pursuing his child. Lady, which do you think came first? That he wanted to see his child, so he pursued resources that would help him see his child, or he stumbled across this legal group and then was like, fighting for my child, that's a good idea. I want to pay money and promote this service for no reason relating to my child whatsoever. Gak offers advice such as, you can snatch the momentum of the case from the opposition. Increase your odds of success by 80%. After working with nearly 10,000 fathers, I have learned that you must remain on offense. Filing first gives you a psychological edge. It sets the tone for the entire case, making her respond to you rather than the other way around. 
Not only will that boost your chances of getting more time with your kids, the chances of paying less child support are also more likely. In fact, the court actually appreciates this approach. Anger and equity rate are mentioned in Gack's introduction, but there's not one word about the well-being of the children. Searching for information about Gak on the internet, he not only promotes his services for divorcing fathers, he also advertises his ability to help snare sports scholarships. Oh, the audacity to be multifaceted. Helping fathers obtain more time with their kids and helping children secure sports scholarships? What a terrible person. She does not respect the hustle. Candelario says that her ex-husband was able to negotiate considerably less financial responsibility than their original agreement. All right, so first of all, she is so mad that he was able to reduce down his child support from what they originally agreed upon. How dare he not go out and find resources and ask himself and others, is this fair? Can I do better? It's funny the way that we see fathers who want to pay less child support as being super greedy, but we don't see mothers who are constantly fighting for more child support as being greedy. Because everyone's default mindset is, well, she's the one taking care of the kids. Why? Why is she the one taking care of the kids? If the father was given time, he would be the one taking care of the kids. <laughs> and again, America is a country where dual income is the norm. Most mothers and most fathers are both working. Beyond breastfeeding, I am failing to understand what a mother can do that a father cannot. I really, I don't get it. So basically this goes on to say that even though he fought for all this time and fought against child support, he actually ended up not going and using his time at all. That is super annoying, but it's also really unfair to completely invalidate parental alienation syndrome as a real complex just because there are some really crappy dads. Like just because in this one case, this man claimed parental alienation, but then did not end up using the visitation time that he was given, doesn't mean that all five fathers are gonna do that. And it's so ironic to me that she keeps saying, oh, the father's rights movement just uses anecdotal stories, but then uses an anecdotal story to completely invalidate the entire movement. It's just this crazy concept that like, oh, that horrible thing happened to you? Well, this horrible thing happened to this person, so that means that that horrible thing couldn't have happened to you. Do you realize how stupid that sounds? Well, thank God we are finally on the last page of this essay. The financial security of custodial parents. Ah yes, the only thing that matters. Is the custodial parent financially secure? That's all we care about. If the non-custodial parent is drowning in debt and suffering, oh well, should have thought about that before being born with a penis. So how much of a motivation is money in the father's rights movement? The 2002 United States Census report showed that poverty among custodial parents fell from 33% to 23% from the 1999 study. Although the poverty rate remained about four times higher than for married families with similarly aged children, while the poverty rate for male custodial parents was significantly lower at 14%. According to the Institute for Women's Policy Research, Women have made tremendous progress toward gaining economic equality during the last several decades. Nonetheless, throughout the United States, women earn less, are less likely to own a business, and are more likely to live in poverty than men. This is technically true, that women live in poverty more often than men. It's barely different. Like, if you actually pull up the charts, it'll be like under 21, 16.4 versus 16.8. 45 to 54 is like 4% versus 5%. It's not this vast difference. And while women live more often in poverty, men are more often homeless. So, like, it's not a competition, but if it was, they're pretty evenly stacked. Further, their most recent national study adds that even with continued economic gains for women at the rate that has occurred between 1989 and 2002, women would not achieve wage parity for over 50 years. Oh, not the wage gap argument. So we're really going to wrap up the worst essay of the year with women deserve child support because wage gap? No. 
you're the ones who said everything should be on a case by case basis. Guess what? Let's look at both incomes because you assuming that the mother is just going to be in poverty and not be a higher earner than the father is ridiculous. And just as insulting as someone may be saying that not all mothers are fit. The census report showed that an estimated 59% of custodial parents had child support agreements and of custodial parents receiving child support agreements, 63% were women, 38% men. The proportion of custodial parents receiving full payments increased between 1993 and 2001, but the proportion of custodial parents receiving partial payments fell during that same time. Those custodial parents receiving full child support were less likely to be living in poverty. A correlation also existed between child support and visitation or custody agreements. The one was more likely to be received if the other was in place. In other words, child support remained an essential factor in preventing poverty among custodial parents, particularly mothers. Yo, this is one of those very real moments where I need you to understand that correlation does not measure causation. The fact that most non-custodial parents are ordered child support and the fact that women's poverty has decreased is not correlated. The idea that women receiving child support is going to pull them out of poverty is very unfounded. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if there was a study that was like, does receiving child support help your life? Yeah, probably. Every time I've gotten money for something, it helps. But to say women would be in poverty if men did not pay them child support, that's a little bold. Disputing these findings are researchers like Sanford Braver, co-author of Divorced Dads Shattering the Myths. With David Stockberger, Braver wrote the book The Law and Economics of Child Support Payments. Braver and others believe child support guidelines have become tilted against non-custodial parents because they fail to consider the large tax benefits custodial parents enjoy, as well as non-custodial parents' child-related expenses. These researchers argue that this bias means that although a custodial parent may earn less money, the higher wage earning and non-custodial parents' lifestyle isn't better than the custodial parents. Right-wing commentator Glenn Sachs and family law attorney Jeffrey Leving contest that these laws often draw drive the fathers into falling deeply into arrears. Yes, I will explain this very simply. Let's say mom makes $15 an hour and dad makes $20 an hour. Does dad make more? Obviously. So he will be the one ordered child support to her. Now, child support is typically 30 to 50% of your entire income. So if he's only making $20 an hour and 50% of that is going to her, yeah, she's making more money. Do you guys not understand this? This is very basic math to me, but apparently people don't get how this can happen. <laughs> Yeah, he makes more money, but if half of that more money goes to her, she makes more money. Even for super wealthy celebrities, child support conflates responsibility and willingness to pay. Sean P. Diddy Combs' recent response to being sued for higher child support payments underscores this. A man known for his own extravagance, big diamonds, big yachts, he balked when the New York State Supreme Court's appellate division approved a child support increase from $5,000 a month to $21,782 per month to his ex-girlfriend, apparently the highest child support payment in state history. In an interview with the Associated Press, the hip-hop mogul called the case an attack on his character. It's not about the money. I don't care how much money I have, he said. If you come at me and say I don't take care of my child, I'm going to take care of that to the end. I do take care of my child to my fullest. That's something that should be rewarded. It's not something that should be handled this way. He plans to appeal because he says he already gives enough to his son. I usually don't even entertain celebrity child support or custody cases because they're so much different than the average Joes. But in this case, P. Diddy is absolutely right. How much more could a child possibly cost a month than $5,000? <laughs> yes, even the rich kids. Because when you go in there and you're demanding more child support, that is you saying, well, he's not spending enough time with his child. He's not providing enough. And like, I'm sorry, lady, I'm providing $5,000 a month. And I don't know how often P. Diddy sees his kids, but often enough to get insulted by that. Often enough to say, look, I take care of my kids because their needs are met, your needs are met, you're just getting greedy. As attorney Jeff Wolf points out, if shared custody was the law, child support guidelines wouldn't apply. 
He believes the father's rights movement has taken a stand to cast the custody issue in terms of a value-based system, even if there's a huge hidden agenda that has to do with shirking of child support obligations. These fathers are busy talking about the value of having a father in order to improve moral development. Again, she's trying to bring up this idea that the whole father's rights movement is exclusively to abolish child support. That cannot possibly be true when it varies so much from state to state. Every father knows that in most states, if they get 50-50 custody, they will still be paying child support. <laughs> most dads have come to accept that, honestly. There are some dads that really hate the child support thing, but most of these dads just want to see their kids. You, the mother's movement, are the one constantly bringing up the need for child support. Most of the father's rights movement is neutral on it. They either don't mind paying it or it's annoying, but whatever, they'll just take time with their kids. The mother's movement seems to exclusively be like, we need that bag. You pay child support or else. So who really cares about it more? These values, moral development, and importance of fathers sound definitive. Yeah, they are. There are so many statistics that prove that children without fathers are more aggressive, more likely to end up in jail, get worse grades, suffer from depression at a higher rate. And you're trying to say that the importance of a father is not definitive? Golly, I sure would love to see this woman's face if you told her that a mother's value is not definitive. Can I tell her? Can I tell her that and just see what happens? On the other side, the values-based argument for best interest of the child remains harder to define neatly. Its message isn't that all children need a father, rather that all children need parents to focus on their needs. Parents emphasizing this value exhibit characteristics such as being open-minded, flexible, and nurturing. The moral standard of such pragmatism is to ensure that stability is assured for the children regardless of parental sacrifice. The father's rights movement doesn't address children's stability at all. What a bold f***ing claim that the father's rights movement does not address children's stability at all. Okay, I'm not going to shut up about this 28-page essay released from the Department of Education that shows and proves the overwhelming positive outcome of shared parenting. Should I mention that 10 more times or? And she keeps talking about the father's sacrifice. She's positioning children's happiness as like this trolley problem in which we sacrifice kind of like useless dads to save the overwhelming majority of children. She's putting up this idea that the fathers need to sacrifice, the fathers need to sacrifice their money, the fathers need to sacrifice their time so that the mothers can have all of it. So that the children can be more with their moms and their moms can be more stable and their moms can be more secure because they don't need a stable dad. They don't need to see their dad. It's all about mom. I guess children are only stable if they're with the mom. That's the only way it's possible. According to Wolf, the best interest of the child standard sounds legalistic, even though it's child-centered. He says, father's rights groups may not appeal to experts. They are not trying to. But legal services, experts, academics, weigh in on the merits of supporting the child's best interests. The public and the legislature are less likely to be convinced by academics and judges. In order to prevail, mothers need to articulate a moral argument rather than a response to the notion that fathers have have rights. So again, she's trying to plant the seed that father's rights advocates are against the best interest of the child. And she uses this quote to prove that. So that quote apparently means that Jeff Wolf hates the best interests of the child. He's simply saying that you need a better argument for why a mother should retain sole custody. Because so far I'm not really seeing anything that presumed joint custody is not in the best interest of the child, besides, very ironically, her anecdotal stories. In the intimate sphere of family, emotions run high, and most especially when the stories that convey betrayal from a person once loved are relayed. The father's rights movement is not monolithic. There are men making a considered if one-sided point about their sense of responsibility and their commitment to vie for meaningful involvement with their children. These men, like Ned Holstein, see their cases in terms of gender discrimination. However, they are unwilling to put the children's needs and rights before theirs. Apparently meaning that a child's needs and rights are mother has sole custody. Others in the father's rights movement are far less articulate and far angrier than Holstein is. Their postings can be found on various father's rights websites. Blind rage fuels their involvement. 
stemming from the sense that the courts treated them unfairly during their divorce proceedings. Given the formidable progress the father's rights movement has made, perhaps especially possible in this particularly political climate, those putting children's best interests first have a great deal of work ahead. Don't we ever! Mothers, fathers, and others protecting children need to band together. They have to take a play from Dennis Gack's handbook and find a way to go on the offense. So there you have it, folks. The father's rights movement is based off of nothing but blind rage. These men have no real reason to be upset. It's just so easy to accept being an every other weekend dad when you used to see them every day. It's just so easy to give up 50% of your paycheck to your ex. It's just that easy to give up any educational or medical decision making. I just don't see what dads are so mad about. What's with these silly stories they're telling about moms not letting them see their kids or letting them know that they were signed up for sports games and they're missing critical years of their lives and some of these parents haven't seen their children in literal years despite court orders. Oh, but some of my friends' dads don't want to be involved, so that means no dads want to be involved. Oh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah Worth and Buttonweiser. It would be Sarah Worth and Buttonweiser to write this article. Look, the family court system sucks for both moms and dads. I, unlike Buttonweiser, am not going to invalidate these women's stories who were treated unfairly by the courts. So if I've learned anything from this, it's that, God, it is worse for fathers than I even thought. I mean, this is what we have to deal with. It's the absolute failure to recognize the fact that one of these movements is fighting for the child to have both parents equally and one of these movements is fighting for the mother to have the predominant amount of time and the predominant amount of that father's money. But I'll let you pick which one you think is better. Are you Team Father's Rights Movement? Or are you with Button Wiser with the Mother's Movement? Look, I'm a mom, but I'm gonna go with the Father's Rights Movement on this one. Thank you so much for suffering along with this with me. I have other cringy articles to read and share with you. So if you have enjoyed this shared suffering and you would like to see more on my potato camera, please subscribe, follow my pages below, keep posted because I will be coming out with better and better content as I continue to grow as a creator. Until next time, dads and dad lovers, bye.